hi everybody. Um, I am your surprise second speaker <laughs> today. Um, my name's Lorna. I'm a developer advocate for Vonage. Um, and I feel like that doesn't tell my whole story. I've been working in the API space for, oh, years and years. And um, I am just super passionate about sharing API knowledge and just enabling all of you to be able to do amazing things with APIs. So today, my talk is called Beyond the API Reference. Um, and if you caught the beginning, Mark and I had a little exchange about I've spoken at API the Docs before, and I often talk about API reference documentation. Um, but I wanted to talk more with you today about developer experience and kind of, kind of the wider uh, space around the API reference um, by itself. Now, after I had this talk accepted and started writing it, a company called Postman that you may have heard of published something called the State of the API Report. Now, um, I found this very affirming because I wanted to share with you my impression about some stuff, but they have data and I love data. I focused on the wrong window. There we go, there's some data. Um, so I brought you this chart <laughs> from the um, executing on APIs section of that state of API report. Now, um, you, can, you can look this up. I've got a link in the references page, but it'll wait while you listen to me first. Um, this section says, um, and I'm just going to read you the quote that they published with this graph around... Um, the obstacles to consuming APIs. It says, when asked about the biggest obstacle to consuming APIs, lack of documentation clocked in the highest obstacle to consuming APIs, 54.3%. By an extremely wide margin, and I'm eyeballing this chart, and that's a pretty wide margin, yes. Other top obstacles to consuming APIs are lack of knowledge, complexity, and lack of time, all cited by a little over one third of respondents. All very interesting. The next section, respondents with six or more years of API development experience were more likely to mention lack of documentation than those with naught to five years of experience. So when you are an expert on APIs, a lack of quality API documentation, the more experience that you have, the more of a hurdle that is for you. And I think that's very interesting. One more of these, because State of the API was a really good report. And this one's about how to improve API documentation. Um, and it's, again, executing on the APIs section. And it says, our respondents had insights. The most helpful enhancement API producers can make to provide better examples in the documentation, sorry, is to provide better examples in the documentation, followed by sample code, and standardization. API consumers also find real world use cases, better workflows, additional tools, and SDKs to be helpful, although to a lesser extent. So I feel like there's there's a whole, this is right on, on theme with my feelings in this space and what I wanted to bring you. Um, and if you need <clears throat> any support to justify the work that you are going to propose after you've seen this, talk, then I definitely would go there. And there's a bunch of other insights that I found super helpful. But this talk is not the state of API. Um, but we should probably do that because it is really interesting. Um, so thinking about, OK, we've got an API. The API has really good reference documentation. And I'm making that assumption because if your API does not have really good re reference documentation, like it's not an API. If no one can use it, don't publish it in the first place. Controversial, perhaps, but genuinely, um, it's not an API unless there's enough documentation for me to read it. Once you've got that far, what's next? What are the things that should go around it? I like to think of this as being a menu, um, a menu of options. Perhaps you could choose one from each column or um, start with the authentication overview spend some time on a troubleshooting guide. If you are looking at this list of things, uh, my joke API reference, API experience menu, um, and feeling a little overwhelmed by the choices, like that's 
okay. A little bit of overwhelm is all right. Um, but I want you to remember, and I don't want to judge anybody's eating habits here, but in general, when I go to a restaurant, I do not order the whole menu the first day that I go there. There are restaurants where I have eventually ordered everything on the menu in a series of different visits, right? So this is the menu you're just going to choose enough to satisfy you. Um, today's talk is all about directing the resources and the skills that you have to make the best impact that you can. Okay, it's not you must have all of these things. It's do you fancy one of these? My favorite has to be the getting started content. It is a very popular myth that developers do not read documentation. And they do, <laughs> not very reliably, but it does happen. Developers do sometimes read documentation. So your getting started content is really, really important. I love to see an overview of an API. Now, I've, I'm a very experienced API integrator. I don't really need APIs explaining to me, but if you have a paragraph that says, it's basically RESTful, um, we use OAuth2 with such and such a token for integrations, uh, for authentication, and um, everything's in JSON format, boom, I'll probably read the reference docs next. That said, every API is someone's first API. So don't be afraid to go overboard with explaining things. Um, developers will typically find the information that they need, um, even if you have over explained things. Always include at least one working example. It's very rewarding to be able to copy and paste an example and have it work. And then, hooray, everything's working. Um, also make sure that you, if there's other things they need to do, that you link those absolutely upfront. So if there's a sign up page, they need an account to use your API, which is I think true for a lot of APIs. Make sure that's linked. Um, at Vonage, we have, we put some of the tracking query parameter stuff in just to try and give us an idea of what's coming from where. It's not an accurate measurement, but it helps us understand kind of proportionally who's coming through. Um, if, if someone needs to know about pricing information, make sure that information, so everything they need at the beginning to know what they're getting into. I called my talk beyond the API reference. And my next piece of advice is in the API reference. So, I mean, in terms of trading standards, hmm, <laughs> I am not sorry for bringing you API reference advice as well as beyond the API reference advice, and it's this. Examples of requests and responses can, can fill a gap um, for all sorts of use cases. There's lots and lots of value here. So if you can get responses, like I can read this response example that you can see here, um, and immediately know what I should expect in return from an API. This is one of the main reasons that I adore working with open API, because as a format, it encourages descriptions, examples. There's like five different ways to do examples. We think maybe there are too many and we might take some out of the spec, but it is more than just the name of the field and the data type, right? It gives you a lot of context. And what I love about a documentarian audience is you use those examples for good, right? You use them to go together, to tell a story. And I think that's really, really valuable. So don't get carried away with really advanced concepts or building big things. Actually, response examples will help developers a lot. So make sure that you include those in the API reference. OK, let's see if we can get back to where I was supposed to be beyond the API reference. And we're going to talk about code samples. Now, <clears throat> I work in developer relations. And DevRel is really all about meeting developers 
where they're at and speaking their language. And I, I don't know what could be more, <laughs> more, more on their own turf than writing the code samples for the tech stacks that those developers are using. So I think code samples are incredibly valuable. They need to be copy and paste. They need to work out of the box. As you can see here, um, we have got, um, uh, this is six languages plus curl. Um, language seven is currently on my to-do list, but I had a talk to write. <laughs> so you can watch this space if you're into Golang. Uh, keep an eye on the, uh, on the documentation, uh, on the Vonage developer portal. If you publish SDKs for your API, go ahead and use them in these tech stacks. If you don't, don't worry about it. Just use whatever would be the, the normal or mainstream way to do HTTP handling in that tech stack. Um, developers will put together the clues that you give them. So even if you show how to do it in, um, I don't know, in uh, request or requests, and then they're actually using Axios or Guzzle, right? They'll figure it out. Um, the more examples you have, the better. And that's one reason why we always include curl here is because all developers should be able to read this and convert it, even if it's a tech stack that we don't manage. Um, I'm going to do a small tangent because I find it impossible to converse with this audience about code samples without someone asking me how we do that, because you're all experts in your documentation platforms. So here is a small tangent. The basic idea is that you write the words you would write if it was only one language. So you write some introductory words. This isn't very many, but if it's more complicated, you write the words, you have some placeholders, you describe what those are, and then you go ahead and show the code sample. But what we actually do is we have pseudocode for the example. Then every tech stack implements that in its own way. And we put those as standalone examples into a repository. So there's a repository of code snippets for each of the languages that you see here. And if you only found those code snippets, you can use them all from those repositories. There's config, you, they're executable, there's a readme. You just run those things by themselves. Then in our documentation, we write our words and then we pull in for each language the relevant lines of the file. Um, it's a submodule. It's There's a lot of YAML. We've got some custom wiring. It's amazing. <laughs> and so it means that the samples, this, each of the code snippets is retained and maintained in its own repo and then pulled into the docs platform. You can click to copy within the docs platform and you can also go visit it on GitHub if you want to see it in context of the whole thing to use it um, or fix it or whatever you need to do. Um, so that is a little tangent because um, I think our code sample stuff is amazing. One thing I will say is, yeah, we've got seven languages everywhere. We're an enormous team, okay? We're like 40 people now across SDKs, docs, um, developer education, videos, events, community. We're a lot of people and that means we can staff this. I know that's uncommon and any code samples in any tech stacks have value. You do not have to be shipping this from day one. We weren't. Okay, so do what you can do with the resources that you have. All right, on that theme, let's talk about a content format that I like to call X with Y. It's our internal way of referring to this type of content. Okay, so it's lots and lots of permutations and combinations of X and Y, where X is a common task like uh, make a phone call or add two-factor authentication or, um, yeah, do a video conference. I don't know, IVR. Y is a tech stack. So you'll get Express or Python. Um, sometimes we'll do Python and Flask and Django. Um, or you'll get PHP and Laravel and Symfony and Slim. Um, and we'll add all these different things. This screenshot's from our blog. <laughs> you can see, I mean, this is like half of our send an SMS with posts. They're just the ones that come up next to each other when you search for it. The values, the, the value on the X with Y is that it's a more complete experience than just the code snippets. So with X with Y, 
these are standalone posts. And there's a good chance that a developer will only read this post um, when they just need to do one thing. It also means that we don't need to fit in. Like, I don't think we have any other Elixir content. But if you want to send an SMS, we're, we, we've got you covered. Um, so if you are not ready to build up that whole matrix, you can start doing it here. We do this as blog type, type content. It, I think it would work equally well as documentation type content, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. So we take the particular topic and a specific, a specific task, a goal, and a specific tech stack. And we go ahead and we combine the two and we do that from beginning to end. So we do sign up for an, I'm gonna say Nextmo account. We've recently rebranded. Sign up for a Vonage account. Um, <laughs> this Nextmo in my screenshot is a little bit distracting. <laughs> sign up for, for a Vonage account, you know, um, install the library for Node.js, uh, set up index.js like this, run it like that, view it in your browser like this. If it's a webhook, it'll show you how to how to set up ngrok or at least link through to the article that's about setting up ngrok to do webhooks. Developers might come here and never read anything else, and that's fine. Um, I always say that developers are skip readers, and I think you know as long as you provide a way for them to navigate within the words, um, I call it furniture. But you know what I mean, like headers and diagrams and bits of code snippet and bulleted lists, you know, things that just break up the wall of text or wall of code and make it a little bit more digestible, but also navigable. Furniture is not the technical term. Uh, is there a technical term? Tell me, tell me if there's a technical term. Or we could just all agree to call it furniture, maybe. Um, I think uh, <laughs> I think maybe I always will. OK, um, so that's X with Y. I think this is really valuable content. And it, all of it counts, right? From the beginning, even if you don't have all of the Xs and all of the Ys, all of it counts. So I, I really like this. I think it's a really positive way um, to expand on the API reference. And also, it's, it's very task oriented. So if you need to call more than one endpoint to achieve a thing, this is a great way to walk developers through it in a way that the snippet for accessing a particular endpoint isn't. And I think we have all had that experience of meeting a new API. And there's a big list of endpoints, but you don't know which one you want. You know, that's not the name of the thing that you are thinking of. So this can really help to um, point people in the right direction. I'd like to propose that you also create a troubleshooting guide. Now, this is one of my favorite formats, um, partly because it actually doesn't, I think anyone can do this for their API. Um, it doesn't have to be finished immediately. Um, it's more like a living document, but it can make a really big impact immediately. And you can assemble it from checking Stack Overflow and talking to your support people. Right, invite the support people for coffee, digital or otherwise, and ask them what the most common problems are <laughs> and put them all in one place. The idea of this is that um, the search engines can find it, users can find it, um, and it gives them uh, more of an opportunity to help themselves more quickly. And I think that's ideal. Um, you will run into people who tell you that you cannot use negative language like troubleshooting in your title. I'm sorry, um, yeah, call it something else. Um, but as long as you're pasting in the error messages that people might run into, then um, it's really, really valuable. So common solutions to common problems, put them all in a place, um, and it can be like tips and tricks or whatever. Um, we have a few where it's not necessarily that they are obscure problems um, or that the answers don't exist anywhere else, but they're things that we find come in as questions to either us in DevRel, through our community channels, through our support channels. So heading those things off, I think, is really valuable. Um, so for example, we have a connection error, which indicates that you have a really old version of Java and you're missing a dependency. Um, I'm becoming an expert in that, even though I don't actually really write any Java. Um, 
A generic message which has a non-obvious remedy. If you make the wrong API call with the wrong timing to one of our APIs, it will tell you that this thing has never existed. It has. Please wait 20 seconds and try again. Um, <laughs> it's just it, most of the time you'll never see this problem, but it is possible to see it. <laughs> so just that kind of helper thing. Just it's all about enablement. It's all about empowering people. And I feel like this, uh, yeah, this, this really does it for me. Let's find, um, let's talk about tools that documenting things that are not your things, right? Um, and this is something that we have recently done more of at Vonage um, because um, I think we felt like if it wasn't our product, it wasn't our problem. But actually, I have found, especially as we've started streaming more this year because we're not traveling, um, and I really find that developers get an enormous value from seeing how we work with our APIs. So I have been pushing um, more content out that relates to not us, but things that we use all the time. I already name checked ngrok, of course. And if you work with APIs, like two-way APIs, we do, you can send an SMS. You can also receive one. So you need to be able to receive a webhook. Uh, phone calls, you get a lot of events during them. So there's lots and lots of incoming um, API calls, like webhooks, callbacks. So ngrok is a key skill for working with any of the Vonage APIs. Um, we also have always had documentation for Postman in one form or another, but I've recently expanded it. And there are two things that I really encourage users to do with Postman. Um, one is to import the open API specs, which will give you a ready-made collection. Um, and that's a really good way to get to know our APIs. And lots of users don't know about it, so we have dedicated documentation for that. Um, we've also recently published an, a Postman collection for our most common APIs. And for a long time, I was like, just import the open API spec. Stop talking to me about this Postman collection. But I'm a convert. Um, <laughs> and I'm a convert because I can add just a little bit more on the Postman collection. So for example, we have a lot of every, a couple of our APIs have a format parameter. Um, so you always have to put the string JSON in the field. Um, you have to fill in credentials, and they're slightly different in different places. Some places they are header parameters. Sometimes they're actually ordinary form parameters. Um, sometimes the response of one request gives you a value you need to use in the next request. So there's a bunch of things that you can do there. So we have we ship a collection with an environment variable. I don't think I've linked to this. So maybe we could find it for you if you want to see it in the docs later or talk about it in the own conference if you would like to. But yeah, you just, you sh I ship a collection with an environment. Users import that, in, click the run the collection, get it in their own setup. And then when they put their creds in the environment that we supplied, a bunch of stuff just works out the box. So it's, I know the developers have really appreciated it. What's been amazing to me is how much my internal colleagues have appreciated it. Um, so yeah, if you want to make friends inside your organization, <laughs> publish a Postman collection because uh, support are using it, products are using it. I mean, obviously DevRel are using it. Um, it's been really useful and I feel like an idiot because I dragged my feet for a while um, on that. Uh, Prism is something we use for mock server um, and sample apps, the scrappy scripts that you build yourself to test things or try stuff out or send sample data. Could you package those for reuse? Really? Because I feel like there's a bunch of things that we do every day that would just um, cut corners uh, that other, and save time for other developers as well. Awesome, colleague Mark has shared a link to the Postman stuff in chat. Thanks, Mark. Okay. So let's talk about demo apps. So this is a natural follow on from the kind of scrappy sample scripts. Some of them grow up to be demo apps. Other demo apps might be, they're just miniature villages or toy, toy versions of real applications. So you need to think of things that are sort of plausible 
but not super complex. The idea is that developers can use that as their starting point and kind of jump off into using your API. You can pick your favorite use cases. So if you know of stuff that people are building or you get questions about really often, um, then use that as the use case. Um, I sometimes take inspiration from the verticals that sales talk about uh, with video products. So we've had quite a lot of classroom and telehealth type stuff going on. Those make really good demo apps. Somebody might use it not so much as the basis of their own application, but as a way to see how the moving parts would move if they need to build it themselves. Don't feel the pressure to build it over and over in different tech stacks. I mean, you can, but try to mix it up so that you're reaching, again, whatever resources or knowledge you have on your team, try and deploy that a bunch of different ways to meet different communities and allow different sets of developers access to a bunch of pick and mix things. Um, and yeah, build a load of fun stuff and write up what you did. Bonus points, bonus points if it's deployable um, and users can find the blog post about it, grab the GitHub repo, run it themselves um, and uh, generally take care of themselves, definitely. Okay, I wanna talk about SDKs. Your documentarians, maybe this is out of scope, but maybe it's not. SDKs are a really big piece of developer experience. Um, this is a separate talk. I gave it at API Specifications Conference. Um, ask us if you would like the link. Um, but I really think this is important. And I also think that you can make a big difference with a small investment. So you don't need to ship a whole complete library, but maybe just a small one that does maybe one of your APIs or a particular set of tasks that you think is most commonly done. That said, please only ship what you can support um, and, and encourage the community to participate. We have all our libraries open source. I mean, for historical reasons, because we believe in it, but also because sometimes the community has had to help itself where we have not necessarily had the resource to ship things immediately. Um, I've recently shipped a Go SDK and that was based entirely off the open API description. So we have open API, it powers our API reference documentation. You can import it into Postman. You can teach your mock server to run it, but you can also generate client code from it. Um, and I gave a whole talk about how that works and also the importance of writing code that keeps the sharp edged machine generated code away from your lovely users. But you just write a little bit of code in the middle that looks like you would want to use and then call into the generated code from there. So always consider SDKs if you can, um, and don't be afraid to do you know quite a limited installable package but if you think it would be helpful, it probably would. And just like for your APIs, um, documentation is key. So um, yeah, definitely keep your documentation hat on as you dive into all of this. Be real. Um, don't hide yourself behind the brand or uh, the company name. And I want to be really clear that I'm not asking you to be available all the time or on your personal channels or anything, but you're a real person. And by being really present um, and being, being able to direct people to where either you or other help is, I think is really important. And I have found this also a really good way to get feedback on the docs, the product, the tools, the libraries, whatever. If people understand that I'm a person and they can talk to me about a thing, um, and it'll come in by email or uh, talk to Mark about what we find in the feedback mechanism. Um, but be, re be real, um, be visible, um, and try to, I feel like documentarians are an underappreciated part of developer relations and the way that a technical company relates to its communities. Um,
but I think you are part of that relationship, whether you or your um, employers acknowledge that. Um, so be out there because I think that's a really good way to get um, really good feedback and to really be part of a strong conversation that can only benefit to both sides. If you were overwhelmed at the start with that big menu, you're definitely overwhelmed now. So hopefully I've given you a bunch of ideas. Um, one of the things I've missed about doing this digitally is, is in person. I so enjoy Write the Docs and API the Docs where people use pens to write notes. So if you're using a pen right now, oh my gosh, how exciting that somebody could be using a pen to write my talk write notes down from my talk. Um, you may have a lot of notes and I just wanna remind you that we, you know, you, you can't build this by yourself. You can't build it in a day. It's about being selective. If you really don't know where to start, then remember the menu. I have some chef's recommendations for you. First of all, adding the request, the response, examples. Um, I think that gives developers a lot of context to help themselves to the next step. The getting started documentation showing people how to begin working example, walking them through, and then maybe common tasks. And again, try and mix up the uh, tech stack if you can. It's lovely to have lots of extra content, video content, that kind of thing. Um, I, the videos are dessert. They're delightful, but unnecessary. So don't get hung up on that either. They're a lot of work. The written, um, the written content uh, just, enables people to find it by search engine, to have it read aloud or bigger font, or it's very inclusive. So always go there first. I'm preaching to the choir. I know I am. Um, but these are my recommendations. Um, so oh, I've kicked off a stationary conversation. This is brilliant. And um, if you have questions for me, click the ask a question button and start typing now while I tell you about my resources and then Mark will choose. Um, so ask a really good question so he picks yours. Uh, first of all, the link to the state of the API report that I cited right at the start, um, links to our SDKs and our blog, which doesn't seem to have rebranded yet. It's like, re Anyone else been through rebrand? It's hard. <laughs> um, the SDKs, I talked about giving an SDKs talk. I am also published today on the Nordic APIs blog with, a, with something called Build C Consistent and Delightful SDKs. The URL was really long, but it was published today, so you should be able to find it. The slides from this talk are there, um, so please help yourself, and I can post that in chat as well if you want. Um, and yeah, find me on lonajane.net. You will find my blog posts and talks that I've given, and yeah, I try and link to what I'm doing. Um, so that is that. Awesome. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>